Happy Mother's Day. I had a great morning. I got breakfast made for me. My bacon was perfect. My French toast was delicious. My eggs were good. I got a Pioneer Woman little cake pedestal. And my children didn't fight too much this morning. That was like, they started, you know, that little bit. And then I pulled themselves back in. And I was like, yes, this is a great one. So it's been a great Mother's Day. I know that as we're going to celebrate today, Mother's Day, you know, it's Hallmark's an American Greetings favorite holiday, I believe. I, I had to do greeting cards myself for um, as part of my job, and I'm telling you, they had a greeting card to cover everything. There were greeting cards for moms, of course, grandmas, great grandmas, aunts, sisters, like a mother, someone special, Mr. Mom. I mean, they had a greeting card for anyone. And I thought, you know, it's Mother's Day for some people is a great holiday because they had great moms. So they love this this holiday. And unfortunately for some people, Mother's Day is not that great because their mother's already passed, or maybe their mom didn't win any awards. Um, or they their children, some I, there was I know three people so far I've already read about that I know of, I don't know them personally, but I know of them, that their children have passed this year. And so they're having to celebrate Mother's Day with a child that, that has passed. So it's not always, you know, a great, great holiday for everyone. And then the thing with Mother's Day is, it's great that they take one day to celebrate us, and of course we got Father's Day coming up to celebrate for fathers. But the truth is, even on Mother's Day, we really don't have the day off. Mother, we never, mothers, fathers, parents, we never really get the day off. And parenthood never stops. We are parents forever. And just that is, you know, even when we could be 90 and someone can, I, I was in a store and it was a really older lady and she did something and they were commenting on her manners and she's like, well, that's because my mama raised me right. And it, you just, you never get away from, from being a parent. Or you shouldn't try to get away from being a parent. I joke about, you know, when my kids are all out of the house, it's just me and my husband. <laughs> They're going to have to schedule visiting hours. You really can't just show up whenever. I'm just kidding. But it, being a mother is incredible. And I was thinking about worldly mother terms. Uh, if you're familiar with a tiger mother or a helicopter mother, those are worldly terms they give parents. Uh, a tiger mom is really strict. You're going to bring home straight A's. You're going to do this. You're going to make your bed this certain way. And they just they have so many rules and regulations. And tiger moms believe they're the best because... They keep their children structured. And then there's the free-range parenting. I think that was probably my mom. That was, hey, go do it like a chicken. You just go on out and do it free-range. You bump your head, okay, you'll learn not to do that again. You burn your hand on the stove, guess you won't touch that again. So the free parent, hippie-range parenting style, mother style. Then there's the helicopter mom. We've all seen those type of moms. They're always around their kids like this. Don't touch that. Let's move that down. Let's put safety things on everything. Everything's got to have bumper pads. Everything's got to be protected. And so there's all these worldly terms for parents. And then, you know, there's always parenting magazines saying why you shouldn't be a tiger mom or you shouldn't be a helicopter mom or a free-range parent mom. Well, what, you know, what's the Bible say about being a mom? That's what I want to know. I want to know what kind of mom I'm supposed to be. And even though I've got children that are going to be 16, getting their driver's license, all the way down to nine, I'm still their mom. It's never too late. Even if you have kids that are 30 and 40, it's, it's never too late to be a better mom. And so we're going to go into Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1. And I read this scripture and it just it, it impacted me. It says, a wise, every wise woman buildeth her house. But the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. I brought a little illustration. Just one little her hands. <laughs> As I just want to spend a few minutes talking about how wise women and how we build our houses. And you know what? This can apply to the guys too. And those of you who don't have kids, take note. Learn from us. Learn from our mistakes. Those of you that are still going to have some more children, see, you got some practice in, so it would be good to go with those twin boys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the first thing, I was looking up how you build a house, and the first thing they say, of course, you go to take your site, but you're going to build your foundation. And Jesus says that, you know, he talked about two men. There was a wise man that built his house 
on a rock and a foolish man that built his house on the sand. And we all need a good, firm foundation. And the best foundation we can ever have is Jesus Christ and his word. And I started thinking about Jochebed, who is, and I looked that up so I pronounced it right, just so you know, I kept playing on Jochebed, Jochebed. She was Moses' mom. And, you know, we don't know a lot about her. We know all, you know, she's one of the most famous characters for Bible stories. We always talk about how she put Jesus in a boat. I mean, she put Moses, made him a little, a little boat out of reeds and put him in the Nile with all the crocodiles and set him down the river. That's a great Bible story, Sunday school story. If you really think about that, great, his mom stuck him in a boat and just launched him out with the crocodiles. But here is a woman who is living in a time where she's a slave. They, they, her grandparents were probably slaves. Her future thoughts was her children was going to be slaves, even though they knew supposedly they were supposed to be getting out of Egypt. They actually had a timeline, 450 years, to put me out of the calendar up. We got 50 years to go. We got 60 years to go. But they knew that they were going to be getting out. But she's a slave. She already has two children. She's got Mary and Aaron when she gets pregnant. And then the word comes down. If it's a female child, she gets to live. If it's a male child, we're killing it. Now, I can't imagine as a mother when I was pregnant with my children, if that, when I was pregnant with Judah, if that edict had come out. Because I would imagine as a mother, you would be there going, please be a girl, please be a girl, please be a girl, please be a girl. But she doesn't have a girl, she has a boy. And scripture says that he was a goodly child. She couldn't kill him, so she hit him. For, she hit him for as long as she could. I can't imagine how many nights she laid in bed, how many times that she was a little bit uncomfortable, worried when the guards would come through and trying to keep him quiet. I hope he was a good baby. He kept, kept quiet, didn't have colic. But the time came when she knew, I, I can't hide it anymore. So as she built that boat, I'm sure there were many prayers and tears. And she's like, God, I'm trusting you to, to take care of him. And she puts him in the boat. She launches him in the Nile. And she sends Mary and the sister to follow him. And we know the story. God intervenes. And Pharaoh's own daughter finds him and decides to raise him. And Mary comes up and says, hey, I know someone that can nurse him. So who gets to nurse him his mom? And I don't know how long she nursed. I don't know how, they, how long they nursed back then. Um, I know it was longer than we traditionally do now. But while she nursed him, she put a foundation in him that all of Egypt could not shake. I mean, put yourself in Moses' shoes. You're being raised by Pharaoh's daughter. You're a grandson of Pharaoh. You're rich. You're powerful. You have anything you want. Nothing's a sin to them. They, any pleasure, any physical thing they want to do. They have all power in their words. They're considered like gods. And he is raised with that. Now, if most of us were raised like that, that's a pretty good gig. We're not leaving. Everybody's waiting on your hand and foot. Now, he was trained. He was trained how to be military. He, he, he had schooling. It wasn't like he just got to sit around playing Minecraft all day. But at the same time, he was rich. He had a good. But whatever Jochebed in her short little time was able to lay that foundation for Moses, when it came time for him to make a decision, I'm either a Hebrew or I'm going to stay an Egyptian, he chose to say, I'm a Hebrew. Why would you ever want to identify with slaves? Hey, no, I'm an Egyptian. We're good. We're good. Yep. Yeah. Pharaoh's grandson going to rule someday. But that foundation was laid Incredibly. I would love to ask her, what did you do? How did you get that kind of foundation laid in your child in that short span of a time that he knew who he was and the world was never able to take it away from him? Now, do I believe Moses indulged in some stuff? I'm sure he did. He's human. I'm sure he didn't live completely righteous as he was growing up in Egypt. But his foundation was sure and secure. And then I think about the wall. The next thing after you build your foundation, you, you frame up for the walls. And I think some of the found if the foundation's not secure, the walls aren't going to be, they'll be okay. But you need both. But if you got the foundation firm, then you start to frame up those walls. You know, we're not the three little pigs. We can make it out of hay or wood or stubble. We've got to frame up something that our kids can build on. And I, I started thinking about Timothy's mother and his grandmother, Lois and Eunice. And... Paul says of them that they had unfeigned faith. They had great faith. They were great women. But once you stop and think about something, these are two Jewish women raising Timothy up in Lystra, a Greek city where they worshipped Greek gods and worldliness. They weren't 
getting to live in some Jewish city or some Jewish place where everybody lived like them. They stuck out like sore thumbs. And from what they say, Timothy's dad was Greek. I don't know if he converted to Judaism, if he died when Timothy was young or, or whatever, what kind of influence he had on Timothy. But Timothy grew up in a Greek city where everybody did what they wanted to do at that time. And somehow his mom was able to, his mom and grandma frame these walls for him that Timothy ends up as one of Paul's favorite people, an incredible man of God. So even in the midst of a world that appears to have gone crazy and everybody just does what they want to do, we still can build up a frame for our children they can build their walls on. That will last. And the next thing you do in a house is they say you put in the windows and the doors. It sounds weird that you do that to me before the roof, but you put in the windows and the doors. And we shape how our children view things and what they will, how they will see things and how they will let things in. And I've probably been the guiltiest about this, not helping them have the best windows and the best doors. You know, I think about Lot's wife. She taught her girls how to look at worldliness. So much that when the angels came to warn them to go, two weren't leaving because they were married and they liked what they were doing. They had to drag the other two out. And so as, as parents, we can teach our children to look to things of God or we can teach them to look to things of the world. You know, there was a woman whose name I won't say right. She was a Maka, a Maka. She was uh, the mother of King Abijah. And she, as the queen mother, got him to institute cultic worship the goddesses again. So as a mother, she had taken this Jewish king that should be standing for righteousness and tearing down the stronghold and the idols. She gets him to reinstitute the worship of the goddesses. And then I think of Herodas' mother, who convinced her daughter to revenge was the best thing. Because her daughter danced and could have asked for anything she wanted. And her mom says, you know what, we need to get even. So ask for John the Baptist's head. And so as parents, mothers, even fathers, we can teach our children how to view the world. We can teach them to always be negative about everything. Everybody's out to get you. Everybody hates you. It's, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. You, you do it first. Or we can teach our children, hey, it may look bad, but God's got this. So we got we to gotta teach them how to look out those windows, how to control that door, Who you gonna, what you're going to let into your house. Because what we're doing is we're building little houses that are going to live someplace for eternity. And however we help them build their house is going to affect them for the rest of their life. And if we do a poor job, they're going to have to rebuild their house. But if we can give them a strong foundation, teach them how to frame, they'll have a good house to start with. And then the last thing that they put on, you know, is the roof. That's my cool little bird house. My kids are wondering how birds were going to get in there if they were fat. And it's like, well, if they're fat, they don't need to eat. So just skinny birds in there. But... You've got to put that roof on. And I thought about Rizba. Rizba was one of Saul's concubines. And she had two sons. And for those who aren't familiar with the story, after King David um, was king, they were having some issues and he prayed about it. He was told he had to go make things right with the Gideonites. The, the Gideonites, for those of you um, who maybe don't remember, are the ones that tricked Joshua. They took their clothing and made it look old and their food look moldy when they were going, when Joshua and were conquering all of the, the land and they were told not to make any agreements or treaties with anybody in the area. And so the Gideonites, they tricked, they came up, they looked like they were way far away. And they talked Joshua into a treaty that he wouldn't harm them. And then Joshua found out that was his neighbors. But so, but hey, God has this thing. He's kind of strange about this. If you make a covenant or a vow, you're supposed to keep it. And so Israel was bound to keep that covenant with the Gideonites, and they had broken it. And so the Gideonites said, David had to go to the Gideonites and say, what do you want me to do to fix this? And the Gideonites is like, we don't want money, we want blood. We want seven sons of Saul, we want to kill them. Bloodthirsty people. And so David honored it. He went and he found seven sons of Saul, two of them who belonged to Rizpah. And the Gideonites took them and they hung them up. They killed them and they hung them up. And Rizba wasn't the only mother who had sons there. Seven sons were hanging up there. Only two belonged to her. And after they were dead, 
Rizba figured, well, someone's going to come down, they're going to take them, and they're going to bury them properly, and nobody shows up. And Rizba says, oh, no, you're not leaving my sons here. They're not going like this. And so she stays, not for a day, not for two days, not for weeks, three to four months. Can you picture for four months watching your children rot while you're staying awake, making sure that the birds don't come eat anything and the wild animals don't come? For four months. You're, I'm sure people were probably bringing her food and drink to sustain her, but she's like, I am not leaving here until you do right for my children and put them in into a, you bury them right. You're not, they're, you're not desecrating their bodies. The only mother out of seven children that did that. Now you can say, well, that, you know, our kids were dead. What's the point? There's a principle here. And I can speak from experience. When your kids are going through something that looks like it is never going to end, or they're going through something that it, it, it's, it could be an illness or sickness or it, it could be an attack, you've got to learn to build a roof of prayer over your children that says, you know what, I don't care what it looks like. You're not getting my kids. I'm putting protection on them. And we've got to learn how to pray and apply the word on this house so that our children learn how to pray and apply the word over their own, their own houses. And I love Rizba because here's a woman who lost everything. First of all, she was just a concubine of Saul. She wasn't even a wife. I can be loud. She wasn't even a wife. She was just a concubine. So, and then Saul's killed, and all she has left is her two sons. And then they're taken. And it seems like she's lost everything. But she didn't lose her, her dignity to the point. I don't know what happened to Rizba after they were buried. But Rizba said, I'm putting a roof over my kids, and you're not, the enemy is not going to destroy them and, and to pluck them. And so, you know, as mothers, we've got some great moms in here. That Sister Duke, I think, is a great mom. Jordan Bright's on her. Called Mama Duke. Um, you know, we have Hillary's a good mom. She's got her little angels. I'm, you know, I'm an okay mom for the most part. <laughs> you know, I got Auntie back there who's like a surrogate mom. And we, we've got those that will be moms eventually someday. Jelly, Jordan, Marissa, baby. <laughs> and we got, you know, as, as mothers, we're celebrating this Mother's Day. I, I was just impressed by the Lord. I, I can do a little bit better. And maybe in some of these areas, I haven't done as good of a job as I can. But you know what? There's still time for me to go back and work on it. I can go back and I, I can work on it. And I made a small little gift for the mothers today. This one. This is just a sea salt, sea salt scrub, like if you're in the labyrinth when you go in the bathroom um, and you just put a little bit of it on your hands and then you can rinse it off and dry it and it'll make them real soft. And the stuff I put in there is supposed to be like this calming, relaxing thing. So I was kind of picturing like when the kids are stressing me out, you could be in the bathroom going, <laughs> but I made this salt scrub to talk about, because we were talking about building houses. I want you to know, I just want you, if you use it, and if you don't, that's fine, but I, if you use it, just each time you use it to remember how important your hands are and what you have to build. And even though sometimes it doesn't feel like it, you've, you're making a difference. You're doing a good job. And you just remember that you are important. Your hands are important. You know, sometimes I just feel like a glorified maid and a glorified babysitter. Some days I do. And, when my, and, you know, in his motherhood, sometimes when I look at my kids, they'll do something, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm doing something right. I want to frame this moment. I want to capture it. But other times when my kids are doing stuff, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm the worst mother in the world. If I was a better mother, my kids would not act like this. But the truth is we're just all a work in progress. And we're just, we're doing, we're all doing the best that we can. I hope that we're all doing the best that we can. I believe that we are. And... So I just, I wanted to just make this gift, one, because I wanted to do something for you. I wanted to physically make it. And I, I wanted you to, you know, I prayed over them, because I want you to know that I believe in you guys. I love you. And I love this foundation that we're building. And I know, don't feel like it, but by this time next year, we're probably going to be double, maybe even triple. But, and 
there'll be other programs and things will be going on and all of that. But this year, I just want you to know, I believe in you guys. I believe in what you're doing. I believe in what you're putting in your kids. I think it's incredible that you're coming to church and not just coming to church, but you're raising your children on a pew. I wish I had been raised in church. I, do, I wish, I wish I had been raised in church. And so, God doesn't look at what you're doing and just dismiss it. In a world today where you have parents that spend so much money putting their kids in pageants and their dance classes and um, preparing them for all the sports, um, which I'm, I'm not against sports, stuff, but you understand what I'm saying. They, they all put so much effort into something that really is not going to affect eternity. I mean, it don't matter whether you make it into the Hall of Fame or you won the dance competition or your honey boo boo or whatever. <laughs> At the end of the day, that's not that eternally. People, the parents are investing so much into their children that don't matter eternally. That just matter down here temporarily. And I'm not saying you shouldn't help your kids be the best they can. And, you know, they need to be educated. They need to do well. But you understand you got to balance it. And so you guys are doing what's the most important thing. You're putting things into your children that really do matter, that will last for eternity. And so I just want to say happy Mother's Day. And I also made this little thing about building your house. Just a little prayer thing that I talked about that will just kind of go over what we talked about that you can kind of use as a prayer thing I, that I'm doing. Just asking the Lord to put a spirit of Jacobet in me and a spirit of Rizba um, that I will stay, you know, the course. Because like I said, you know what, it does, motherhood doesn't end ever. Don't thought that depress you. I mean, they look they get bigger, they can kind of get their own cereal and take care of themselves. But I'm always going to be a mom. Even when my children are grown and they're married, I know I'm going to be that mom. You got enough food? Do you guys need anything? Do you need a decent amount of bread? I, is your lights on? I'm just going to, it's going to be me because they're my kids. I'm going to want to make sure that they've got what they need. And and the grandbabies can call me at any time and just say, Granny, I need this. And I'd go over there getting it. And then my kids would be like, you guys stop doing that, Mom. And I'd be like, shh. So, because it's just, that's in us. That, that's, that's supposed to be in us. And so, you know, I'm going to be the mom that'll be over if my son-in-law's being mean. And I'll just be over looking at my daughter going, well, what'd you do? Why is it being mean? You must have done something. You treated him <laughs> So, I just... I, I want to just say I love y'all. I appreciate you. I think you're great moms, and, and you're some role models for me. All of you, even Hillary. How she gets down in place with her kids, I think it's great. I should have done more of that. I was too busy cleaning my house. You know what? Now I don't even clean my house. I, I should have spent more time playing with my kids. So happy Mother's Day. I love y'all. And before you leave, I'd like you to, to get one of these.